Great. Thank you. And yes, thanks for inviting me to speak today. Our first folio is one of my favourite. I shouldn't I shouldn't say that I have favourite books in the library. They're all equally important, but it is definitely one of my favourite books in the library. So it's great to have the opportunity to speak about that. So I thought I would start with the outside of our book. And as you can see, I, it's a nice binding, but it's um, it, it's not the world's most interesting binding, I would say. It's from the late 18th, early 19th century. And um, that reflects the fact that it was rebound at that point. And a, a, a lot of the early, uh, any information that was contained in the bind, early binding or early inscriptions or early ownership marks at that point were lost to us. So we don't know the hugest amount about the early history of this book. But what we do know is that it has been in Scotland for more than half of its life. The first time we heard about our first folio, um, we hear our first folio mentioned, is in 1784, a Miss Clark of Dunbar. And all I know about her is this one fact, Miss Clark of Dunbar gave the first, her copy of the first folio to the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland in Edinburgh. And that's one of the two things we know about her. And the Society of Antiquaries had only been founded a few years earlier. And as you can see on the inside, they probably did this rebinding and you can see their um, badge or logo here. And they had been founded a few years earlier. They put out a call for saying, we're trying to build up collections of the antiquities of Scotland. If you have interesting objects, then send them to us. And so she responded to that call by giving them her first folio. And in the 1930s, the National Library of Scotland was founded in 1925. It was based on the collections of the Advocates Library, but founded as a separate institution in 1925. And so in the 1930s, the Society of Antiquaries, which was um, around, the street, around the road in, at the National Museum of Scotland in Chambers Street, got in touch and said, we have these books. And this was one of a number of valuable rare books. They thought the best place for these will be in the National Library collections. And so it was... Um, sent to the National Library at first on deposit, and then the Ad Ant Society of Antiquaries donated it to the National Library in 1949, and it's been there ever since. And Miss Clark of Dunbar said this was one of the two things we know about her, and the other thing we know about her is that she connects Shakespeare, England's bard, with Scotland's bard, because in 1787 she met Robert Burns when he was on a tour of East Lothian, and he kept a journal of that tour, and he left us a description of us of her in his journal so he says i call her miss clark a maiden in the scots phrase good enough but no brent new a clever woman with a tolerable pretensions to remark and wit while time had blown the blushing bud of youth of youthful modesty into the flower of easy confidence she wanted to see what sort of rare show an author was and to let him know that though Dunbar was not it was but a little time, yet it was not destitute of people of parts. So a literary woman who was interested both in the writers of the past and the contemporary literary scene and appreciated a good writer when she saw him, I would think, which is why she was interested in both Shakespeare and Burns. Our copy is not 100% complete. Before it was rebound, it clearly sustained a bit of wear and tear and damage. So it lost some, uh, one or two early leaves. It lost the last page. And as you can see, the title page was damaged. And at the time it was repaired, at this point, they did what was very common at that point when you repair books. And that was to lay the damaged page on top of a good page so that it could be uh, preserved properly. And somebody at that point, and possibly a bit earlier, has done some amending with a pen to fill in the gaps. And as you can see in close up, if you look at Shakespeare's right eye here, this engraving of Shakespeare on the title page of the first folio is notoriously not a brilliant work of art. Um, it's not the, the person who wrote the poem beside the um which faces it which ends look not look not on his picture but this book I think they maybe had a sight of this print and thought this is not how I would like Shakespeare to be remembered but somebody has colored in the 
right eye which was damaged there was a hole in the page and someone has tried to ink in his eye so they've given him I think a really sinister expression and he does look like he's following you around in um, a slightly sinister way when you open the book what makes the first folio so special there are several different things and the first one I think is the work put to put into assembling it in the first place and the two people who assembled it John Hemmings and Henry Cundall were Shakespeare's business associates in his company and he when he died he left them money to buy mourning rings which is quite a common thing to do at that time and it's possible to sentimentalize this and maybe I do but I like the thought that they they memorialized him in this way instead by putting this volume together and they call up um I'm just going to need to change my view so that I can see my own screen here uh, they they wrote in this about how much they appreciated Shakespeare and their motives for us putting the volume together and the time that they did this is a very rhetorical age. People use very rhetorical ways of speaking and writing. And sometimes it's possible to, you think, well, what, how much of this is sincere and how much of this is rhetoric? Because they really want people to spend what was the reasonable amount of money buying this book. But I do think there's a sense, there's some emotional truth in this where they write, it had been a thing we confess worthy to have been wished that the author himself had lived to have set forth and overseen his own writings. But since it had been ordained otherwise and he by death departed from that right, we pray you do not envy his friends the office of their care and pain to have collected and published them. And so to have published them, as where before you were abused with diverse stolen and surreptitious copies, maimed and deformed by the frauds and stealths of injurious impostors that exposed them, even those are now offered to your, your view, cured and perfect of their limbs, and all the rest absolute in their numbers, as he conceived them. And then they say, it is not our province who only gather his works and give them to you to praise him. It is yours that read him. And there we hope to your diverse capacities you will find enough both to draw and hold you. For his wit can no more lie hid than it could be lost. Read him therefore again and again. And I think there is, this is, this is rhetoric. There are strategies here to persuade you that if you've ever bought an edition of Shakespeare, uh, one of the individual quarto copies of Shakespeare's plays that are kicking around forget that this is the real thing you will get better texts here than anywhere else but there's also an element of we really wish he had put, been here to put this together but since he isn't here we're doing it for him oh, trying to move myself. ah here we go this page um is a page that's missing from our copy and I've taken this image from the Folger Shakespeare Library's website but they listed also in the book the names of the principal actors in all these plays. And by the time they put this volume together, quite a few of these people had already died. Um, and the Globe Theatre, where many of the plays had been performed, had burned down. And I feel a bit, this is this volume, they're not just remembering Shakespeare, they're remembering that whole company of players and the experience they had putting on the plays together in the theatre. And the work of the company, it seems to me, as much as the work of Shakespeare. The next thing that Shakespeare's, that the first folio volume tells us is, it really sets the context, it still influences today how we think about Shakespeare's plays, what we think the canon of his plays is, and how we categorise them. So for instance, Henry VIII, which is a play that Shakespeare almost certainly wrote in collaboration with another writer, is in this as Shakespeare's work without any attribution to the other writer. Another play, um, The Two Noble Kinsmen, is not in this. And it's another work which he also wrote in collaboration. And because Henry VIII is in this volume and The Two Noble Kinsmen isn't, our perceptions of the relative merits of these plays and the relative Shakespeareanness of these plays differs purely and simply because of the long influence of the first folio down the ages. The second thing is how they're categorized. So you look at a play like Richard II, which is listed as a history, 
it's about English history. You look at a play, King Lear is also about English history. It's listed as a tragedy. And that affects our perception of these plays. In the first folio, the actual text of Richard II begins, it's called The Life and Death of King Richard II, and it's divided into acts and scenes. An earlier edition published as an individual play in 1608 calls it a tragedy. It's not a, the life and death of Richard II, it's a tragedy. And when we look at the scene breaks, it's divided, as I say, into these acts and scenes. If you zoom in to the bottom right hand corner of the, this page, which is the next page on from the first page of the text, second scene that people leave the stage, there's a scene break. Then two other characters actor and start uh, characters enter and start talking to one another. In the quarto, you have the same break, but it is not a scene break. It's just two characters, and two, some people leave, some people come on stage. And also, a little bit of the language is slightly different. In the first folio text, you can read, Alas, the part I had in Gloucester's blood doth more solicit me than you, your exclaims. Whereas in the um, quarto text, you have, Alas, the part I had in Woodstock's blood doth more solicit me, and there's a comma. Then your exclaims. And this is the kind of thing that scholars and people who care very much about the text of Shakespeare spend a lot of time look, examining these different editions and trying to compare them and working out which of these is the better text, which is closer to what Shakespeare, what, what Shakespeare wanted us to read, what the earliest edition of the text is, did the text change through time, is one of these texts better than another. And in fact, a lot of the principles that we now have about how you study bibliography and what you're looking for when you're comparing copies and comparing editions are based on the efforts of people who were working about 100 years ago exactly on this subject and very closely comparing these different editions. But the main thing about the first folio is that it preserves plays that otherwise would be completely lost to us. And I thought I would show you this um, I'll tell you this was done on an image and not on the actual book, but I'm going to show you the impact of if we did not have the first folio. We would not have a substantial number, about half of Shakespeare's plays would not have survived through us, including some of the really key works, I think, and some of the plays and characters and languages like and concepts and phrases that really resonate down the ages, um, as you like it. Time, um, Twelfth Night, two plays which have a lot to say about gender. You have boy actors disguise, boy actors playing women disguised as men. Um, Julius Caesar, Friends, Romans and Countrymen, Lend Me Your Ears. The Winter's Tale, The Tempest, Lot Macbeth. So many key works would have been completely lost to us. And I thought, what we could maybe do would be have a look at some of these plays and um, highlight some of the things that only come down to us because they survive in this volume called The First Folio. And I thought if anyone would like to volunteer, put your hand up and say you would like to read any of these things, please do so, because I would really love to hear that. I think it's one of the most, um, you, none of us gets the opportunity to do this very often. So to spend some time and have a look at these words as they first appeared in print is, I find, always really exciting and interesting. I've chosen a couple of examples, and the first one is the speech, Jacoby's speech from As You Like It, All the World's a Stage. And I just wondered if anyone, I can't see actually because I'm sharing my screen, maybe Rachel, you can tell me if anyone brave person would like to read this I, know, I would love it if someone did I don't see him are you ask? do you mean the full section Helen you can just read if if you want to you could just have a try, have a try the first couple of lines if that's what you would like to do but I thought it would be really um interesting to have a look at it I, I'm not going to be nasty and pick out specific names I'm not going to do that okay? <laughs> I'm not going to do that um, I mean, I'm having a look through it and 
I mean, there are definitely words that I don't recognize. Um, Helen, would you be willing to do the first? I'll, I'll the read first you the film? first couple of lines of it. Okay. All the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. And one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. So that's one of the most famous scenes of back in the days when people learned vast chunks of poetry at school. It was a very, very much piece people learned and a recitation piece. So it's been a hugely influential bit of text. Mm -hmm. yeah, I need to get back onto my presentation. Here we go. The next one is the Macbeth and here you can see the opening. When shall we three meet again in thunder, lightning or in rain? When the hurly burly's done, when the battle's lost and won, that will be ere the set of sun. Where the place upon the heath there to meet with Macbeth. I come, Grey Malkin, paddock calls, fair is foil and foil is fair, hover through the fog and filthy air. And if, like me, you read this at school and it was one of your set texts at school, it becomes so much a part of your makeup that it's almost impossible to imagine a world that does not have Macbeth and the witches and Lady Macbeth in it. Um, but again, a play that we would not know about at all if it were not for this one book. I picked out Twelfth Night purely and simply because it's my, I want to say it's my favourite play. Um, there are several that are particularly favourites, but it's one of, it's probably the play I love the most. And again, it, it blows my mind. This is the play that introduced me to Shakespeare. And I would be really, uh, just to think, my perception of, of Shakespeare would be entirely different if I had not come to it through this text. And the final piece I wanted to show you was um, a famous passage from The Tempest, which I thought would be appropriate to end with. Our revels now are ended. These are actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air. And like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, all which it inherit shall dissolve. And like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. Thank you. Thanks so much, Helen. Uh, that was so good to get like an insight into your copy um, and obviously like, your different kind of like, you know, area of expertise as well. Um, so thank you so much. If anyone has any questions, you are very welcome to take yourself off mute um, or you can put your hand up um, or you're welcome to post it in the chat um, and I can read it out there for you. Um, Helen, I'm sorry you didn't get any takers for, for reading it out there. And, you know, when I first looked at it, uh, I think it's um well it's the font that kind of threw me off like that kind of threw me off but um I guess you'll be very used to kind of reading uh you know the certain there are certain letters I think it was um the S that kind of looks like an F yes um, can, can you tell us a wee bit a wee bit about that and I think the U's look like V's don't they so was that just because of typewriters you know or was so this 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 is um in the 16th, 17th century when mm -hmm. printed. Um, in fact, so first of all, the S, the S that looks like an F, but it's not really an F because it doesn't have the crossbar. It's mm -hmm. called a long S. And that was absolutely normal up until about 1800, even a little bit into the 19th century, you'll see maybe sometimes early Jane Austen novels, um, I think have still got that long F. So it was absolutely normal um, at that time. And then mm -hmm. the other thing, as you say, I and you, uh, I and J and you and V. And this is where um, they, because because so much text at that time was produced in Latin and so many people read in Latin and wrote in Latin and they're, they're, the, the, the written alphabet came from Latin. And so mm -hmm. these letters, which exist as separate letters in English, but don't exist as separate letters in Latin, um, Okay. They get conflated, and that's why you sometimes see I for J, I for J, um, and U for V, or sometimes vice versa. Okay, thank you. Because when I noticed, um, when I noticed that, and I mean, I must have seen it before, you know, in old texts, and I've just kind of like forgotten about it. But when I spotted that the U's kind of look like V's, I was then trying to find a V to see if that looked exact, 
exactly the same. I don't know if that would ever cause confusion at the time or a... Uh, I think people, because again, if you think a lot of people, a lot of, certainly a lot of men who learn to read would have learned to read in schools where they were taught Latin. So right, okay. for them, it's... Uh, because that's how you learn to read and that's how you learn letters on the page it's perfectly normal for you I mean if you think about how normal looking at an emoji is now and maybe if you're a bit older you remember the first time you saw them you thought what on earth is that but now it's a perfectly normal thing it's the same kind of thing it looks very strange to us but it was perfectly normal to them yeah Thank you. Um, we've got a question here from Alison about are there any other first folios in Scotland and are there any still privately owned? So there is a published census of Shakespeare um, copies, uh, which does mention there is one still in private hands in Scotland. It has been made available to researchers, but it's not um, publicly available in the same way that the ones that we we own and the Glasgow University Library own. Um, are in reading rooms or the one on um, at Mount Stewart is two visitors to View House. Great, thank you. And thanks, Alan, for your, Alison, for your question. Um, Helen, about, um, so you said it was owned by a Miss Clark of Dunbar. Um, and I understand there's not really an understanding of who it belonged to before then. But I mean, are there any indications, you know, as has there been any research and any sort of like hint or is it just completely unknown it really there really is no evidence at all um there is it's all this is the frustrating thing on on the one hand as i said we can see just by the fact that the pages at the beginning and end there are a couple missing and the ones that are at the beginning and end that survive are torn it was clearly you know it had been used it had been mm-hmm. damaged so it's a good thing that they rebound it because it has kept it in a very steady state for the next 225 years of its life until today mm-hmm. but on the other hand what happened when they did that was any information about you know so maybe somebody wrote their name in it maybe there was information about how much they paid for it maybe there were several owners names but we just don't have any of that there mm-hmm. are one or two early annotations they are not um significant they don't tell us anything about you know there's no, nobody's written their name in the book at any point yeah so it is frustrating but we just don't have that information it's just a mystery um and the eye the drawn the drawn eye I almost thought I something was wrong with my contact lens when, I, when you first showed up that page because I do think it's quite you know it is obvious that the eye is definitely like not in the place um that it would be um do we know if that came from Miss Clark's ownership or could that have come from beforehand well I do I, again there's no hard evidence I do wonder if it did just because I I kind of doubt that the Society of Antiquaries or whoever it was they re- entrusted the repair of the book to would have taken what, you know, by that time they would have seen this as a liberty. So mm-hmm. it seems to me that it's perhaps an earlier owner who did that. But okay. again, unless... We're not, we can't be quite yeah. sure. Great, thank you. And we do just have a question about the price, the price of the text. The price of um, the- I think there have been a few up for auction, have there not? I think in past years, have there? Yes, and there was one, and just bear with me because I one was sold, the last one I know of that was sold at auction was sold in 2020, I think. Mm-hmm. I guess so the price maybe would would that vary depending on, you know, the, really like the, the quality and... It really does vary. So the last time a first folio was sold that I know of was in 2020, and it sold for $9.97 million at auction. So that That's is... scary. They're very... Well, they're very, very collectible books. And, yeah. and again, it has been really, since the 18th century, recognised as a really, you know if you're a collector who or a library that has a really good collection of books you really want a first folio so they've always been seen as this um certainly as I say since since the 18th century at least 
hugely important and collectible. Famously, Oxford University Library had a first folio, and then when they got a later a later folio, so the, the first folio, and then there are four more, three more editions, so there are four the, the first, second, third, and fourth folios. And when in, they got a later edition early on, they thought, well, now we've got a better text because we've got a more recent edition and they got rid of their first folio. And it's only fairly recently that they got it back again. Mm -hmm. okay. So perceptions of how, value, how, how valuable this book was have changed over time, but certainly it's had a good 250 years of being seen as a real treasure. Yeah, yes. And um, at the time, Helen, that it was the book was or the text was published, I mean, who would, you know, who would have been buying copies of it? Um, I'm guessing at the time it would have been expensive to buy, you know, a big leather hardback. And it would have been expensive to buy. Um, I, I should be able, I should know off the top of my head how much it sold for, but I don't remember. But I think about it as comparable today to buying something like a PlayStation. So okay. you would not just, if you know, most people would not just think I will nip out and buy a PlayStation. Yeah. You know, it's that le significant level of purchase for most people. Yes. Our, um, our librarian, Julie from Archives and Special Collections, she has put in about 15 S, would that be 15? 15, Shillings. 15? 15 shillings uh, for unbound and one pound for bound yes. but I've no idea of the inflation <laughs> I, can't, I can't think about what that's the inflation why, this is be where to... it's very difficult to know and that's why I think sometimes finding something similar to compare it to rather than the exact money value because yeah you know, it's we and we do there is actually a lot of information about this um that there's a record there are records of early customers and how much they paid for it mm -hmm. so relatively speaking we know a lot about the printing of the first folio and how it was sold and who bought some of the earliest copies including in fact the one at Glasgow which we heard about last week yes yes of course and um who like you know who would be the type of people who would be buying this do you know do we have an understanding would it you know, were people kind of reading it, you know, reading the place for enjoyment at that time? Or was it more kind of exclusively being used by actors for the stage or? So as ever, the people we know most about who read it are the people at the top of society because they are the people whose records survive. So as with the Glasgow copy where we think it was owned by um, you know, a minor aristocrat. Mm -hmm. And and one of the other early owners, I think, remembering his name right, Sir Edward Deering. So again, that level of person. There, it's not just that we know what they did, but we know what they did because they're the kind of person whose records survive. If somebody for I don't know a um, a merchant who had really been a big fan of Shakespeare's plays at the Globe. Um, had saved up for a few months to buy a copy. It's much less likely that we would have that story. Yeah. So it's quite difficult to tell, but I would say in general, it's a substantial purchase is not everybody would buy and more people would find far more affordable the kind of quarto edition that I showed you for Richard II, mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons why Hemings and Kundal right at the start. This is the real deal. Forget those other books. They are rubbish. Spend your money on this one. <laughs> Thank you. No, that makes sense. And do you think, Helen, when did you say it was Shakespeare's two business partners who, um, yes. you know, kind of compiled, like compiled the collection or compiled the folio? Do you think, sorry if you said this at the beginning, I kind of missed it, but do you think that they, you know, did they put them together knowing that they could, pub, you know, they could be published and they could bring some money in? Or do you think that you know they did it because they did recognize like this needs to be saved like this you know this is going to have a legacy and we need to protect this so this is where i also need to mention the people who were responsible for the printing and book selling particularly william jaggard william jaggard had printed some of the quarto editions and had the rights to print them and had been building up the rights to print so it is um Again, they didn't leave us a record of, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the project planning meetings to print the first folio. We're, uh, but a lot of academics have done a lot of 
research to discover as much as we possibly can about the circumstances in which it's printed. And I think there is still a bit of room for um, individual your individual perspective on how much you think Hemings and Cundall sat up night after night compiling the volume and how much they handed it how much they arranged with the printer to hand up to, to do that work and how much this was a labor of love for people who loved Shakespeare and how much this was a business arrangement for people who thought they would be making money it's really hard to unpick that um so but a lot of people were involved and a lot of people were involved you know and I, this is where you think well it's it's they were human beings and it was probably a mixture of yeah. we're we're asserting the copyright in this these texts so that nobody else can print them nobody else can try to make money out of printing them except us because we mm -hmm. own the rights and we think that there is money to be made and we would really like Shakespeare's plays to be preserved in print and this is where I do think compared to a lot of his contemporary playwrights um you know lots of people wrote plays quite a few are lost to us and we're never no you know nobody ever printed them Shakespeare is one of is a I think almost unusual as a professional playwright who wrote a lot of plays and was very popular and seems to have been quite hands-off compared to some of his contemporaries who really you know Ben Johnson put his own works into print in a volume of plays um John Webster saw his works into print and wrote prefaces for them where he explains why he's printing them and Shakespeare was quite hands-off about it so there is I think a sense of well he's not there anymore and this stuff could so easily be lost. Mm. Great thank you. Um, I don't know I don't think we have any more questions from the audience um, so we can let you uh, go and get your lunch Helen um, but just to kind of finish up could you tell us about um, so obviously you know there are a few kind of institutions celebrating for Spoil this year uh, can you tell us about your plans for the rest of the year and how National Library of Scotland's kind of plans to celebrate the occasion? Yes, so we, rather than putting our first Friday on display last weekend, we left that, um, everybody went to Glasgow instead, which was fantastic. Ours will be on display. We have a permanent treasures gallery at in the National Library um, George IV Bridge in Edinburgh, and our first folio will be on display there in the autumn from September for about six months. And we'll probably have some talks and some other events around that as well. And what was the other, there was, one other thing I was going to say about that. Oh, yes, that was it. So Shakespeare's birthday was uh, is generally held to be April 23rd, which is why last weekend everybody was celebrating. But we know that the first folio appeared in print later in the year. Um, there's hard. It's hard to know. It's not like we have an exact date when they finished the printing, but we have a date when they registered the, for the copy in Stationers Hall, which was how you asserted your copyright. And we have a date where, um, as I say, Sir Edward Deering bought a book. And so our copy will be on display on the actual anniversary of the printing of the first folio. And I really like that. Mm -hmm. 